Okay, it's uh, about all for Fab, and Ken's been with us a few times, and I need to stop introducing him and just let him talk. So please join me in welcoming Ken. Well, one thing nice about coming back to a group is, you know, every now and then you pick up a name and a face that uh, that's familiar, and if you're if you're lucky, you can put them both together. Uh, <clears throat> you know, before I get into you know answering the critics here, you know, I guess I'm going to play a little bit of Vince Lombardi. You know, it is said that every football training camp, he said, "This gentleman is a football." We're going to get back to the basics a little bit, so that we're. <laughs> Uh, hopefully all on the same page, or if not, you can at least understand my perspective. Uh, this here is the uh, Federal Reserve Building in Washington, D.C., and it's named after uh, Mr. Eccles, who was a former uh, um, chairman of the, of the board. So a lot of bad things happen there, emanate from there. Okay, first we're going to start out with a quiz. True or false, economic policies should be decided apolitically. That is outside of politics. Is that true or false? Okay, why is it false, John? Okay. Well, my answer to that question is this. Whether you have an active policy of intervening in the marketplace or you have a policy of leaving the market alone, you've expressed by your actions a political point of view so one way or another, everything uh, about economics is political. And in fact, in the early days of, of the study of economics, it was called political economy. What's the year that's going to live in infamy? Very good. And why? What year? 1913. Very good. Now, that's the other danger of speaking to an informed audience. You know, you've got to be on the best, best part of your game here, otherwise you, you'll embarrass yourself. Hopefully I can keep from doing that. Okay, here's one that we heard an awful lot a few years ago. The bust of 08, 09 was caused by deregulation and the free market. True or false? Obviously. Uh, Contributing factors, you know, everybody says the housing bubble caused it. No, the housing bubble was the trigger. There were numerous imbalances, but among the worst of them were in the housing bubble. Uh, Community Reinvestment Act forced banks to make loans they otherwise would not have, untenable loans that were sure to go bust. Uh, irresponsible lem lendings by government-sponsored enterprises, that's, that is Fannie and Freddie. Far more regulation and deregulation took place under the George W. Bush years, more than 80,000 pages added annually. Fiat currency, which leads to malinvestments, was a big factor. And, of course, fraud, most of which was not prosecuted, unfortunately. What is money? Anyone care to answer that, or should I just go to my answers? All right, I will. <laughs> uh, it's described as a medium of exchange, a store of value, a store of labor. Um, what are the advantages of money over, say, a barter system? Yeah. Okay, if I'm a doctor and all my patients are chicken ranchers, how many chickens can I eat? How many, egg, how many uh, omelets am I going to consume? You know, the only alternative I would have to be would be to be a chicken and egg broker if I was going to, to serve this clientele. Through the intermediary of, of, uh, of money, you know, we can specialize our, our, uh, our labor a lot more and increase our productivity a lot more. Okay, I guess I answered that without going to the next page. How about that? Okay, what are some commodities that historically have been used as money? Puka and cowrie shells in the southeast islands of the Pacific, tobacco, cigarettes, horses, livestock, fish, salt, sugar, beaver pelts. A lot of these have some problems. For example, puka shells, how valuable are they to us? Well, even in the South Seas Islands where these were used, they worked pretty well as currency until somebody went to the other side of the island and found that there was an endless supply. <laughs> so they rapidly decreased in value even in that closed society. Tobacco. Well, not all tobacco is created equal. You put a few raindrops on it, it deteriorates rapidly. Same with cigarettes. Horses, livestock. Well, you know, again, the horses and livestock, they're not created equal. 
but let's say I want to I want to I want to buy something worth half a horse. How do I divide it? Fish, same thing, deterioration, salt, sugar, subject to humidity, beaver pelts. You cut up a beaver pelt, is it as valuable as the whole pelt in proportion to the size of the pieces? Not necessarily. So anyway, I've, I've uh, come up with a list, actually I have stole it from somebody else, of uh, some valuable attributes of currency. Scarce, so that it has a high density of value. It has an intrinsic value outside of its value as money. It's widely recognized. It's portable. It's divisible. And it's not easily degraded. Can anybody think of a commodity or two that might fit that description? Gold. Now, if you're not a gold bug, I can understand, you know, not accepting this. It took me two years, three books, and countless articles to change my mind about uh, about the gold standard. So if you're not with me on this, you know, let's just, you know, appreciate my perspective and, and move forward with the argument. But uh, what I have discovered, okay, the uh, use of gold, it was almost worldwide accepted as, as currency, and it facilitated economic trade, not just in the last few hundred years when the West rose, but for, for centuries, for millennia. Gold has been used as a currency. Okay, Article 1, Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution makes, uh, prohibits anything but gold or silver coin being legal tender. Why? My hint here is not worth a continental. Well, it seems that during the Revolutionary War, you know, the continentals lost value because they printed that virtually endless supply of them. So sound as a dollar, that came by quite a few years later. What is counterfeiting? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's one mechanism. Yeah. You know, they, they do, you know, there's other uh, people who counterfeit that aren't uh, part, affiliated with the Federal Reserve. They're just the ones that can get away with it legally. That's making more money. What is inflation? Very good. You know, a lot of people say the increase in prices, but is that necessarily true? Yeah. So, I mean, there are situations where we can increase the money supply and at least some goods and services will go down in price. And I'm going to get into, um, into a further argument on that down the road here. What is fractional reserve banking? On this page, I've written it out. I'll see if I can do it from memory. Let's say I'm Mr. A and I put $1,000 in the bank. The bank is required to have a 10% reserve ratio. And this goes up and down depending on what the Fed feels like that week or that day or that year. But 10% is a historical average. And that means that only $900 of the 1000 that I deposit can be lent out. However, Mr. B uh, comes along and... Uh, anyway, the uh, okay, I, I messed up already. So the $900 is borrowed by Mr. B, but Mr. B's note becomes another deposit... Uh, or for all intents and purposes, so they can loan nine tenths of the nine hundred or eight hundred and ten dollars to uh, Mr. C, and so forth until multiplying this all through, the bank can actually loan out about ten times as much as they have in real hard money deposits. So they have leverage of about ten to one. Now going over to Wall Street and our investment banking friends. I say that with tongue-in-cheek, of course. Some of those firms, at least before the crash, they were leveraging their real money at the rate of 400 and even 100 to 1. Imagine how much money you could take, make if you could reach into your pocket, take a penny and call it a dollar and buy everything in sight. That's kind of what they did. And um, the Federal Reserve, I mean, it can create money out of thin air and just say, okay, print up a bunch of dollars and we're going to dump them into the market, or they can say, okay, we're going to take some money that we just created and buy up securities or buy up um, treasury bonds or whatever and pump more money into the system, and they do that fairly regularly. Okay, higher prices is one of the effects of inflation, uh, booms and busts. Somebody has lent a whole bunch of money and they say, okay, your interest rates are low, let's, let's build up this business. 
but the bus side comes. Uh, let's see, there, there's a quote that comes from an economist, and I can't remember who to attribute it to, but it said, uh, this fellow said, counterfeit money creates counterfeit businesses which can only be sustained through further debasing the currency. And then ultimately the house of cards has to collapse because it can't be maintained. There's the potential. I mean, we're not always going to have hyperinflation every time the Fed screws up, but there are historical examples. Uh, Post-Revolutionary um, War USA, for one. Weimar Germany, for another. Zimbabwe, France, it's happened a couple times. Another effect of theft uh, of inflation is theft by inflation, the transfers of wealth. Those who get to use the, the money first, they can buy things up while prices are still low, assuming that the, the prices actually do go up. And uh, they can make the dollars of the other people who are not so privileged worth a lot less. And in particular, people who save money. I mean, what's, what's the passbook rate on a, on, on a bank at a bank right now. Less than 1% the, the last time I looked. And what's the consumer price index going up every year? Considerably more than that. You know, 2 or 3% if you believe the federal government, and I don't. But anyway, the, the poor people who even make that 1%, they get to pay taxes on the depreciated value of the interest that they make. So they're, they're actually going backwards at 1%. Okay, inflation without higher prices. An example of that, uh, consumer prices during the Great Depression. Stocks, real estate, they went up, but, but consumer prices went down because industry used a lot of the money that the Fed was creating and pumped it into capital, which increased the productivity of labor and afforded uh, them the ability, that plus competition, uh, forced the prices of consumer goods down. Here's another example of how... Um, an increase in the money supply may not necessarily increase prices. Let's say, let's say the USDA, through one of its uh, agencies, decides that it's going to pump a lot of money into the farm, uh, uh, the, into the uh, farm community. So, with the new money, they can buy land, they can buy fertilizer, they can buy seeds, and they can buy equipment. And that extra money could potentially drive up the cost of all of those good things. But when he comes to sell his corn, you know, if the corn crop is twice what it was last year, what's likely to happen to the price of that corn? It's possible that even though he's producing twice as much corn, he could have less net income or perhaps even no net income at the end of the year. And right now, the same sort of thing is happening in oil, in iron ore, in copper, other commodities. And uh, I'm going to reference a, an article from David Stockman, who's one of my heroes, and he wrote this article that he titled, uh, Commodity Prices Are Cliff Diving Due to the Fracturing of the Monetary Supernova, the Case of Iron Ore. And you can read this if you want, but I'm just going to uh, uh, spout basically uh, from memory. You know, the world, uh, central banks the world over have been creating a lot of money in the last 20 years. And in particular, the Chinese economy was built up largely by way of fiat currency, both the currency that we use to pay them and uh, the currency that their own central bank created. So this created a false demand. You know, maybe that 12, 15 percent a year growth was not sustainable. And go, moving on down. OK, here we are. Here's the tracking uh, going back to 94, which is about the start of the rise of the Chinese economy. We're seeing tracked um, copper on the top, the blue, and iron ores on the bottom. And you get over here to about 2008, and, and one of these doesn't track. Iron ore stayed pretty high even through the crash. But you see the copper took a steep dive there. And then as the central banks of the world started creating more currency, prices went back up. And what you don't see here is toward the end of last year, they're doing that cliff dive. And right now, um, iron ore prices are about a third of what they were at the peak. A lot of companies geared up for that $180 a ton iron ore. Historically, it's $20 a ton, and it's down to 60 and the, the big thing is there's a lot of iron ore producers that have greatly increased their capacity 
And for a lot of them, the break-even point is above the $65 a ton level that approximately is where iron ore is at now. And the big boys that have been in a while are well capitalized. They can produce at a profit down to $20 a ton. And it doesn't bode well for those high-cost producers. Now, Stockman observes that... Uh, no amount of money is likely to save this situation. Why? Because the world is at peak debt and even at near zero interest rates, there's a limit to how much debt we can carry. And then the other thing which I just described, there's a huge capacity overhang and uh, he predicts marginal producers will fail just as, I, just as I said. Here's an excerpt from his article and I want to read you this. I'll try not to read too much of this stuff because it gets boring after a while. <clears throat> but he says in his article, the one billion ton growth of China's steel industry since 1995 represents two times the entire capacity of the global steel industry at the time, seven times the size of Japan's then world capacity, and ten times the, the, the then size of the U.S. steel industry. So China alone is producing twice as much as the entire world, or has the capacity to produce twice as much, as the entire world did back in 95. But where is the demand going to come from to keep all those facilities active? Now, part of this, you know, when, when, uh, when China was capitalizing, they're building their industries, they're building their railroads, they're building, hey, even their military, there's a high demand for steel. But, you know, these industries have to turn profits if those debts are going to be maintained and that capital is going to be paid for. Okay, I probably said some version of this earlier on, but, you know, effects of the Federal Reserve, boom-bust economy, falling value of the dollar, concentration of wealth that affects the poor and the middle class the, the, uh, the most because they're not sophisticated investors, and even if they um, have the, the uh, knowledge to invest wisely, they might not have the resources but another big thing that I'm very concerned about is all this money has greatly in increased the size, the cost, and the power of an increasingly oppressive federal government. And then the last thing is we're enslaving our children in debt. What is a Federal Reserve Bank? A system of 12 regional banks. They're owned by the member banks, but some of the positions are politically appointed. The Federal Reserve is both a bank, it acts as a bank, and as a regulator. Can anyone join me in seeing that there might be a conflict between acting actively as a bank and trying to regulate the industry that you're active in? Um, I, I think it's untenable. If, if there any form of the Federal Reserve is going to exist, I think those two functions need to be split. The better idea for me is to get rid of it altogether, but uh, I would accept the compromise position short term that splits them up. Now, some people say, oh, all this fiat currency they're collecting huge amounts of interest on. Well, a lot of the money that the Fed parked in the, in the too big to fail banks, they collected near zero interest on. But even at that, three quarters of the interest they collect is turned back in to the U.S. Treasury. So the harm is not the interest that they collect. The harm is the money that they create out of thin air that skews the marketplace and ultimately uh, is going to make us poorer. Who was behind the formation of the Fed? Rockefeller, uh, J.P. Morgan, and Rothschild banking interests met at Jekyll Island, Georgia in 1910. And if you want to find out any more about that, where's that book? The Creature from Jekyll Island, right over there. I'm not going to try to compete with, with uh, Ed Griff Griffin, is it? Or? Yeah, gee, I'm not going to try to compete with him, but, you know, he wrote a few more pages than I had time for, as you can plainly see. What was the justification for the creation of the Federal Reserve? Well, the two biggest justifications were to stabilize the economy and to protect the value of the dollar. Has this been successful? There have been at least 17 significant economic downturns since 1913, the largest and most notorious being the Great Depression, and the second most notorious, the one that we haven't quite recovered from yet. After how many years is it? Oh, eight, seven years. We're going on seven years of economic downturn that we're, we're still working our way out of. Now, sure, there were... Huh? 
oh yes, everything is coming up roses and sunshine. And I have this little smoke machine over here too. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, economic downturns. We've had 17 of them. That's a significant number. And the one in the, in the uh, 1930s, that lasted the better part of a decade. The one we're in, not quite out of yet, that's lasting the better part of a decade. You know, before the Great Depression, they had what were called panics. You know how long the typical panic lasted? 18 months is a long one. It's almost unheard of that uh, an economic downturn lasted longer than 18 months before the Federal Reserve got their fingers into our monetary pie. And on the second point, at least 94% of the value of the 1913 dollar just went out the door down the toilet. So the Fed, by its own standards, is a monumental failure. Right now, the Fed owns uh, about $2.8 trillion of federal debt. When I gave this talk five years ago, it was under a trillion. So they've, all, they've about tripled, and a few years before that, quadrupled the amount of debt that they purchased. In addition, they've placed money in the accounts of the big six institutions in particular, the too big to fail investment banks, and these banks also bought federal treasuries, which propped up our federal government. Without all of this, they'd have had to have taken a hard look at balancing their budget, at not spending more, but instead they're uh, creating this economy that is sure to fail in the long run, and they're enslaving our children with these debts. I didn't put this on a slide, I meant to, but uh, we have over 18 trillion. It's like 18.1 trillion is the nominal debt. And I think that's understated. Some people think that the $6 trillion of mortgage debt that's likely to, to fail should be included in that, which would make it 24, because that, well, most of that is federally guaranteed. And uh, in addition, there's unfunded liabilities. And depending on the assumption, it's a, at the low end, $95 trillion. And I've seen figures as high as $220 trillion as our unfunded liabilities, even at the low end. That's in excess of $300,000 per man, woman, and child. What is the opportunity that that's going to be paid in any meaningful sense? Zero. Well, except for one thing. The Fed can keep on creating the money to pay the, you know, just keep this ball rolling. Yeah, I... Thank you for that. These people are sharp. Okay, so what happens to fiat currency over time? Well, Mr. Voltaire, the great philosopher, he said, paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value, zero. And moving one step further, does anybody know what that picture is of right here? Deutschmarks. And that's, you don't see it quite so well in this picture, but that's a furnace in post-World War I Germany. The currency was worth more as fuel than it was to go buy groceries, uh, clothing, or other goods and services. So they burnt it. That's a potential that we have. One problem we have today, though, most money does not exist as, as currency. It exists as a blip on somebody's ledger, an electronic blip. How are we going to burn those electronic blips when it, we can't afford gas and coal and oil? Okay, the original TARP was, you know, I know they rearranged everything, but, you know, $850 billion was the approximate size of the first TARP. Anybody here know that there was more than one TARP? John does, I know that. Okay, TARP 2, I like to call it, $16 trillion. That money was used to bail out the big banks. Well, I'll, I'll get to it later. I got another slide on that. And that came about because of the partial audit that was included in uh, a bill that was passed in 2010. That's how we know about that $16 trillion. TARP 3, I like to call it, that's quantitative easing. And then toward, uh, you know, most recently, the Federal Reserve was taking $85 billion a, a month, which it created out of thin air, and buying up $40 billion a month in mortgage-backed securities, MBSs, and another $45 billion a month 
to buy federal securities or a trillion dollars a year. So we've every year the Federal Reserve has been outside of that 16 trillion every year. They've been adding another trillion dollars uh, to our monetary base in one form or another by buying up this stuff. And uh, we still don't have a sound economy. QE4, the Fed has periodically sent money over to Europe to keep countries like Greece afloat. What's the opportunity that's going to happen over the long haul? And then there's something called the primary dealer's window, which is at the New York Federal Reserve, and the people on Wall Street can come there, get a bucket load of money, and uh, use their multiplication factor, their leverage, and uh, you know through that system of fiat currency, they uh, drive up the price to make the sale, to pay the commission, to pay the fat cat bonuses, and, and hey, I, nothing wrong with being rich as long as you do it honestly, but a good share of what goes on on Wall Street is not honest. It's theft, pure and simple. It's fraud, pure and simple. Lloyd Blankfein deserves to sit in the James, same jail cell as Bernie Madoff. The difference is that the fraud that Lloyd Blankfein has committed is far greater than that of Bernie Madoff. One was legal, one was not. Oh, Lloyd Blankfein is CEO of Goldman Sachs. I'm sorry for uh, assuming that everybody knew that. We're getting there. Okay, one of the assertions of the uh, defenders of the Fed is we need to keep the politics out of it, right? And a corollary of that is, you know, we're threatening their independence. Well, history would have us know that Greenspan, Bernanke, and now Janet Yellen all lobbied for the chair position, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. That's, that's kind of politics, isn't it? Arthur Burns lobbied Congress against uh, Nixon closing the gold window, and we all know what happened there. He was overruled, so again, politics prevailed. And there's currently a ferocious lobbying effort by Yellen and the Fed, and again, I would say that's politics. Okay, here's an article from a few years ago, 2009. Government Sachs, Goldman's close ties to Washington arouse envy, raise questions. And we're going to get back to Mr. Greenspan here uh, pretty quickly. Or, uh, no, uh, Hank Paulson, I'm sorry. You've got to listen to what I think. All right, Goldman Sachs, in this article, Mr. Whalen uh, says, Goldman Sachs is a political organization ma masquerading as an investment bank. They're sitting at the table with the top people in government, says Goldman critic Christopher Whalen, the managing director of Institute for Risk and Al Analytics, which rates banks and provides customer analytics. He calls Goldman the most political firm on Wall Street. Average Goldman employee makes over $660,000 a year. And again, I'd have no problem with that if it was made honestly, but it's not. Goldman alumni, Hank Paulson, Treasury Secretary, Robert Rubin, Treasury Secretary under uh, Bill Clinton, Neil Kashkari, he was put ahead of the TARP program, and I think recently he ran for governor in California, lost to, lost to Mr. Moonbeam. Well, he wasn't with Goldman Sachs, although he rubbed elbows with a lot of Goldman people and numerous others. I'm just picking on one firm, Goldman. And, uh, but you're right. There's, um, here's a list. I'm not going to go through that, but here's a list of people in the description of what they do. And if anybody's interested, I have it. There are about two pages of this stuff that I didn't even include because there's so much of it. And I think I've made my point in the amount of time that I have to talk here. There's a revolving door between the New York Federal Reserve, the Treasury Department, Security and Exchange Commission, and Wall Street, and in particular Goldman Sachs. The Hill. The Federal Reserve is pushing back against the mounting criticism. I'm going to skip that because I've already talked about it at length, and we're running out of time here. Anyway, this attack on Ron Paul and the audit the Fed bill is evidence that the Fed is political. And, oh, I want to go back to, let's see, can I go back? I went here we are. Okay. Yellen and other Fed officials have sounded off against a proposal championed by Rand Paul that would give Congress more sway over the bank, more political control. But, okay, the second thing, that last statement that I just said, that's not even true. Politics has always been a part of the process, and including the creation of the Federal Reserve. It's always been woven into the fabric of the Fed. 
And this bill that Rand Paul is proposing adds no power to the Congress that they don't already have. And uh, the contention of the proponents of the Fed, Congress can't be trusted. Well, if this is true, it's because, unfortunately, we the people elect people who don't abide by the Constitution. They wouldn't be such a threat if they just uh, took that little book and, and followed it. Another irony is that the Fed funds the unconstitutional acts that the Congress passes. Another irony is the Fed shenanigans um, in the political process. You know, they're kind of in a pot kettle situation here, calling the uh, kettle black when they're just as guilty. Okay, all right, I already said that. <clears throat> okay, we the feds are audited to death. We're hearing that over and over again. Well, if this is true, what's one more audit? All the things that the federal government uh, spends money on, why wouldn't you want to, you know, that's, that, to me that's just a straw man argument. And if everything is, you know, you know, the problem is all of these audits that they have been performing are limited in scope, so we only see what the Fed wants us to see. And the one that went a little bit beyond the norm was the one that was uh, printed up, the, you know, the report was printed up in 2011. And, uh, you know, based on the information in that report, I've got just the top few people that I call the uh, banking welfare queens, Citibank, $2.5 trillion. Now, that $16 trillion I mentioned earlier, $2.5 trillion to one institution to keep them afloat. There have been at least four other times that Citibank has availed itself of the political process to keep their butts in business. This is unconscionable. Morgan Stanley got $2.04 trillion. Merrill Lynch, and you see the list. You know, most of the big ones are right there at the top. Goldman doesn't even make the first page, but, you know, they get almost a trillion, eight-tenths of a trillion anyway. But look at here, Royal Bank of Scotland. I believe that's a central bank. JP Deutsche Bank, central bank. UBS, Switzerland, another central bank. What are we doing bailing out the banks all over the world? But it gets worse than that. Down at the bottom of this page here, I'm not going to read everything because we're running short of time. 35 foreign private banks that our Federal Reserve is creating U.S. dollars and throwing at them to keep people afloat all over the world. What's going to happen if, when, you take your pick, People decide they don't want those dollars. Where's the only place that they're going to be able to be spent? Right back here. And you got the, the petrodollars. We haven't paid with cash. We paid with promises. Those petrodollars, they're parked all over the world. There's lots of other cash that's parked all over the world. If the dollar, people in the world lose faith in the dollar, it's pretty frightening what could happen. Now, the only saving grace is that other central banks around the world are debasing their currency as fast or faster than the Federal Reserve is basing ours. And uh, as one friend of mine puts it, you know, the U.S. dollar is the tallest of the midgets. All right. Well, I want to get through this. Uh, I pretty much covered all this topic. The part, you know, and again, this, this $16 trillion was discovered because of a partial a partial audit of the Federal Reserve. What would they find if they went through with a fine-tooth comb? And this leads me to an almost concluding statement here by another one of my heroes. All those who wish to stop the drift toward more government control should concentrate on monetary policy. Anybody here willing to, uh, to spend a little time on monetary policy? Well, if you are, there's H.R. 24 and uh, S. 264. These are the two audit the Fed bills, and this time I believe they're identical, so there shouldn't be any merging uh, and uh, compromising unless they're attacked. And you can contact your senators at that number there. And uh, to my mind, you know, auditing the Fed is just a stepping stone toward what we should do and the Fed. And, you know, here's the funny thing. Both proponents and opponents of the Federal Reserve say that they will not survive an audit. That shows how precarious they are, and that's all the more reason that we ought to go after them. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, did I go? We can take some questions here. You're actually a little bit early, so we got a question here. I thought I was five minutes over. No, you're okay, Kat. Okay. Can you put the bill
Okay, it's S um, it's R, two H R twenty four. Yep, and S two six four. They both been introduced. Thomas Massey, congressman from is it Kentucky? And well, Rand Paul did the Senate, and Thomas Massey, who is who is another uh, another hero. You know, here's here's the thing. You know. I hang out with a lot of young people, and I'm getting to the point in my life where almost everybody is younger, except that table over there. <laughs> Thank you. And sometimes they get discouraged because things aren't going so well. Well, I've been at this fight for liberty for over 30 years, 32, 30, going on 33 years. And let me say this, there's never been more people who are knowledgeable and involved in the fight in my lifetime than are on this earth right now. So if we can just keep them from destroying the thing in the meantime, I, I think we have a pretty good chance long term of turning this thing around. Sir. At the end of December, they end quantitative easing or are they still, uh, still doing it? Well, they may have officially ended it, but unofficially I'm sure that there's, there's more than one mechanism, not just that, that $85 trillion a month or a billion a month. There's other mechanisms that I pointed out. So you know they're they're keeping on the, with the proverbial printing press. They're yeah. But I mean, our fund that ended at the end of the summer. Right. The only reason they were printing money and buying our bonds because nobody else was buying them. So they had to buy our debt, but now they got Japanese printing money and buying them. Yeah. And the, the Chinese, they own, what is it, 1.25, it's down a little bit, about a half a trillion uh, dollars from their, their high water mark. But there's, there's rumors that the Russians and the Chinese are buying up gold on the world markets, and uh, they might be looking to do something with that. Sir? Is there uh, some concise information about going through 500 pages of economics that will explain what you just went over today? Hey, if, if I can do it. <laughs> so, okay, no. <laughs> I'd be happy to share my presentation with you, and you know, if you, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Short Circuit. You know, where this robot and he's filling himself with memory. He goes to the library and he says, "Input, input," and he reads the books that fast. Well, I can't read that fast, but that's kind of how I operate. I, I take information from a, a lot of different places and and try to. You know, skim what's useful for a presentation like this. A um, website called Hidden Secrets of Money. Hidden Secrets of Money, and it's uh, found at goldsilver.com. One word. <clears throat> Another uh, source of information that I got. I mean, <clears throat> you know, one of the most significant things I picked up from a, a, a website called The Daily Bell. This was like. You know, way before Gaddafi was was killed, but they were saying that our military intelligence, our CIA, and our State Department were working with people who were known Muslim Brotherhood and Al Qaeda participants in Libya in an attempt to overthrow Mr. Gaddafi. To me, that's rotten and corrupt, and that's uh, you know, Gaddafi was a bad guy maybe, but I think what we replaced it with is a heck of a lot worse. David. Oh, I'm sorry. Let people know I've been in contact with uh, three legislators from this area Ron Johnson, Tammy Baldwin, at least their office is close to Ron Johnson. I asked him directly if he's interested in your co sponsor bill, uh, Senate bill. And he said he would not. And he would vote in favor if it came up for a vote. They had to see it. His arguments were the typical arguments we presented today. Well, tell Yellen to call off the dogs. Pardon? Tell Janet Yellen to call off the dogs then if we're going to keep oh, politics out of it. Right. I know. But that's that's a typical politician. They try to... There's pardon? I didn't hear it. Okay. Well, he's a freshman, so keep that in mind. My thought was that he 
Well, it is often said that politicians uh, see the light when they feel the heat. So. <laughs> and even Tammy Baldwin, uh, he did the previous session for the final year of the Senate for the United States. Yeah. Contacting her in the third year Ed. Ken, um, since you spent a lot of time on this subject, it seems, I, want, I want to ask you, is there a period of history that you're aware of that has any comparable aspects to it to what we're dealing with today? And I'm asking that question because of your point of all of the uh, foreign governments that are basically now either in deeply or moving very quickly into this whole quantitative easing approach to try to maintain some kind of economic vitality. <clears throat> is, is there anything in history that compares to what we're dealing with today here? Well, um, I mean, at what level? See, you know, the, the thing about today is we have electronic banking and things can happen, boom, in a flash where it took a, a considerably longer time before we had that kind of communication capabilities. But again, you know, I mentioned that, you know, the continental dollar was debased to the point that, you know, it, it was used as toilet paper, basically. Um, France, twice in the 19th century, they had w what uh, Mises calls the crack-up boom, where, where the, the currency was, was virtually useless because there was so much of it. Zimbabwe, you know, they just kept adding zeros to their currency uh, to the point of uselessness. And what was what was the other one? Weimar Germany, of course. But uh, in that sense, yeah. Now, um, what, what what has not been is there's not been this coordinated effort. And you know, I'll call me a conspiracy theorist, but there's not been this worldwide coordinated effort to consolidate the banking industry in the hands of a few people. It's not been at this level. I mean, it's always been working toward that end for probably a couple centuries, but it's not gotten to the point where it is today. Uh, you know, the, the, it, it's, it's frightening what's, what's going on today. And like, you know, like Mr. Stockman says, commodity prices are not going to recover to the point where most of those firms involved in the production of commodities can survive. And, you know, is there, is there going to be the crack-up boom type of thing? Well, tell me what the Federal Reserve is going to do, and maybe I can, you know, people think you can look into a crystal ball and know, but people are, you know, this is why you don't want the government involved, because, you know, they move slowly, they move bureaucratically, and they move for political purposes. You know, there's no such thing as, as uh, uh, a government agency that's, you know, looking out for everybody. They always have their favorites. If they're looking out for everybody, they're always looking out for their friends more. And, you know, in the, me as a, a private sector businessman, I'm adjusting my, my marketing techniques on a daily basis. You know, trying to find a product that I can move, trying to adjust my production, you know, get the cost down. This is the way private enterprise works. And they can move quickly. Governments can't. So, you know, in spite of the information technology being quite rapid, you know, some of the responses, they're not only going to be not very fast, they're going to be wrong. They're going to do the wrong thing. And especially when people like Janet Yellen are thoroughly imbued in uh, a Keynesian approach to economics. You know, they only know one thing, print. I got to, I got to add this. You know, then you're done. Okay, <laughs> one last thing. You know, I, I read recently somebody patting Ben Bernanke on the back about, you know, how brilliant it was and how he saved the economy. He hasn't saved anything. All he's done is kick the can down the road. And the other thing is, you know, Mr. Genius in 2008, when the world was falling around his ears, he said, nobody saw this coming. Well, that's simply not true. Ron Paul saw it, saw it coming. Peter Schiff saw it coming. Bunches of other Austrian economists saw it coming. And I'm not a professional in this area by any means, but I saw it coming. How come this so-called monetary expert couldn't? You know, he just lucked out that things held together and uh, not not very well for quite a few of us. All right. Thank you, Ken. All right.